This episode is sponsored by My Hopes and Dreams. Oh, and Johnson & Johnson. More on that later. I can tell you exactly the first time I met you. <laughs> and I can tell you that for exactly the first thing I thought yes. of you. The first time I met was in, in August. No, yes, August 2016. At the tail end of Norwich. No, it was, it was, you, you, you came in and sat opposite me. I can tell you exactly what you're saying as well, in that room. Oh, the room. Oh, yeah, yeah, He yeah, came yeah. in, and I thought, Jesus, this guy's like ST17 or something. This bad <laughs> here behind me. What's he, what's, what's this? This chap just, just came in and just like, you know, proper. I was just sitting there calmly. It's my first day RCP, so like a good boy, and I kind of just say that he just comes in and sits opposite me and just throws the ad, the, 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 basically the paperwork at the admin. Oh, yeah, no, the email was late. Like, for fuck's sake. Who is this guy? Trans- no, Who's this transplant surgeon with ST11? Oh, wait, oh, wait, wait, wait. He's a hernia surgeon from Norway. Actually, no, there is no hernias in there. <laughs> right, like he's we, the waiting list is like three years. There's no hernias. Hello again, Mo. Welcome back. Professor, how are you? How are you? I'm well, thank you. And welcome back to everyone on another episode of Scrubbing In. Uh, three months, three months on the line. You'd, you'd be forgiven uh, to know what we look like. Of course, Mo looks different with his yes. new haircut. Yes. I, I was going for a, for a groove from <laughs> Despicable Me, but with the sunglasses. I apologize for the cold and my voice. I'll try to be more, uh, you know, hearable today. Audible, he means, but that's all oh. right. Starts off with small bowel obstruction. Yes. It's a big topic in the general surgical examination, irrespective of subspecialties, almost certainly will come up in some form, whether it's in a, usually in, in adhesional bowel or some kind of um, recurrent cancer or a hernia, typically. Okay, so we have a patient who is 77 year old male who's previously had a perforation in the Hartman's procedure, um, was uh, after the Hartman's had a reversal and that was seven years ago, has now attended the emergency department with abdominal pain, vomiting, distension, not open bowels for three days. How are we going to approach any patient who comes in as an emergency mo? Right. So on my way over to assess the patient, uh, I'm thinking he has bowel obstruction for, uh, from multiple causes, mainly from the, given the age and the background, I wanna exclude that he's got adhesional small bowel obstruction or any secondary causes such as cancer or things like that. I'll go and assess the patient as per the CRISP protocol, taking a focused history and a focused abdominal examination. With regards to the exam, I wanna make sure that there's not been any new red flags with regards to his bowel habit or uh, placing blood per rectum or weight loss. Also, when I ask how long he's been vomiting for, that also indicates how long he's not been eating for. And so it would be a marker of malnutrition, which would further dictate what I would do in my plan of management. Um, I'd also like to ask about his other comorbidities, if he's diabetic, uh, cardiac history, any previous, sur- any previous surgery apart from the operation that's mentioned in the scenario. Um, as well as his fitness and frailty level, given that his age, this also might dictate whether he would be a, a candidate for surgery or non-operative management of bowel obstruction. Excellent. So you covered pretty much all this, the, the key points there. Essentially, it's not just the examination assessment that you usually do. You need to drop in things like nutrition and frailty because they are very important factors with increasing evidence that we are, we're not we're not really addressing them as, as we should be doing, and it's very topical, so be prepared for that in the exam. So having simultaneously, uh, simultaneously assessed and resuscitated the patient, I would then proceed on, and the salient points in the history being, as you've mentioned, the duration of symptoms, the uh, red flag signs, past medical history, drug history, is the general frailty and nutrition, I would examine the patient and they, they may tell you, okay, the examination just shows a distended abdomen, a little bit tender around the umbilicus or, or something like that. And then you would say, as part of my resuscitation in CRISP protocol, should they ask you in detail about that would be what? So for CRISP protocol, I'd like to assess his airway, make sure he's saturating at 94% plus. I'd like to listen to his breathing, especially if he's been vomiting for a long time. There's also, there, he could have developed aspiration pneumonia and also indicate how fit he would be for surgery. So make sure that he doesn't, there's no any impairment in his breathing or requirement for oxygen. And assess his cardiovascular uh, uh, status. So um, looking for signs of dehydration or shock. So um, tachycardia, hypotension, um, looking for capillary uh, refill time for assessing his extremities if it's cold, he's underfilled. 
um, I would ensure that a catheter has been placed, make sure that he's had uh, wide IV access and that he's currently having uh, IV challenges. So if you want to go further detail, you can also say, I would ensure that he's got Hartman's or uh, something that is not normal saline uh, that's got uh, a neutral pH to further stop him from going into further shock. Uh, also make sure that he's, his bloods have been taken for blood count, check his re renal function, liver function, the group safe good. and clotting. Yep, very good. Break it down as per ABC. Yeah. And, and, and it, you, you could summarise that in saying that my strategy would involve resuscitating the patient uh, from the perspective of all of his major organ systems, uh, ensuring end organ perfusion, which would involve an assessment um, and treatment of the cardiorespiratory system, which would involve oxygen, blood pressure monitoring, or pulse oximetry, IV fluid resuscitation, as well as performing diagnostics such as blood tests, which involve full blood counts and everything else that you just said. If they're on anticoagulant machine, especially even if they're not, you'd want a clotting yes. and save. However, my ultimate aim would be to do what? To obtain a diagnosis which is best obtained doing what? So the best imaging as per the ASGBI uh, protocol for assessment of small bowel obstruction and the Bologna criteria is getting a CT scan um, because it helps you more important than establishing bowel obstruction as a diagnosis, it excludes other causes of obstruction, mainly malignancy, uh, as well as other causes such as, uh, and any complications of bowel obstruction, perforation, or early ischemia signs. Excellent. CT scan has a likelihood of detecting 90% of early ischemia yep. in, in, on, on CT. Great. Having simultaneously resuscitated and assessed the patient as per the CRIS protocol, I would obtain de definitive imaging to establish the diagnosis, which in this case would be a CT with IV contrast. Renal impairment, renal failure, we know that there is some effect, but actually the effects are maybe not as large as an emergency scenario. Don't worry about the EGFR. Again, the nephrology team are going to absolutely despise us, but you, you really need a diagnosis and a non-contrast CT really isn't. Um, as helpful as, uh, in establishing that. So it's going to be a CT with IV contrast, and if they say, what about the kidney function? We'll deal with that later in terms of resuscitation, hemofiltration, whatever they may need. And then once you've obtained the CT scan and the guidelines that you mentioned, whether it's NASBO, ASGBI, uh, by the way, the ASGBI have got a very good uh, yes. one-page summary of the protocol, which is based on diagnosis of resuscitation, and then it's based on uh, the key steps of kind of assessing the patient, diagnosing them, treating them, and then reassess re reassessing them. Uh, and the Bologna guidelines as well. All of them advocate the same thing. The key th step here is that you need to emphasize is you need an early diagnosis because you can't really go down whichever avenue they want unless you've got that. For example, they say, actually, this is you're not going to treat somebody for adhesional small bowel obstruction if there's clearly bits of hypoperfusion in the CT scan, or actually this is a recurrent malignant disease, so you can't really, you know, your treatment algorithm is going to change based on that diagnosis and early CT, which seems obvious, but you need to make that clear. Okay, a CT scan shows dilated loops of bowel, no ischemia that you're worried about, and they may just put, a again, a, f a fuzzy iPad in front of you, or, or, or there are other tablets out there, and uh, they, to, to look at the picture, and you would say there's a cross-sectional image in a CT scan with IV contrast on these three or four slices demonstrating whatever you see, dilated loops of bowel with no cutoff, or there is a cutoff, if you can see that. And then you've got the diagnosis as adhesional small bowel obstruction. Now you know which road you're going to go down. What's going to be your plan? You've already set a catheter. You've resuscitated in the patient. What else additionally? You don't want to go back and say the same things over and over again. You want to start off by saying, having established a diagnosis of adhesional small bowel obstructions, I would. So establish the diagnosis of adhesional small bowel obstruction. I would uh, start a period of conservative management for 36 to 48 hours as per the ASGBI uh, protocol. Um, that would include a large, uh, large nasogastric tube to decompress the GI tract um, with four hourly uh, aspiration. I would also, given the long history of, uh, if the patient has had long history of vomiting about five days, um, it's unlikely that his uh, oral nutrition is going to resume. So I'd also ensure that he's got a central line or a, pick or a peripheral line uh, for TPN. I'd also ensure that he's got an hourly monitoring with your output. Uh, I'd brief the patient of our findings and our current plan. I'd also uh, 
set up for a potential need for a laparotomy or laparoscopy. So ensure that the rest of his investigations are completed, such as an ECG or chest X-ray, to, uh, as well as clotting is corrected and the group and save is ready, uh, so that he's appropriately prepared for a laparotomy or a surgical intervention if required. Excellent. So those are really key points there. What you want to essentially demonstrate is that my overall strategy would be one of conservative management, which would involve all the things that you've mentioned, which is fluid, continued fluid resuscitation, monitoring of fluid input and output. Very, very important. On a ward round, you often ask, what's the NG tube output? And they say two liters. Okay, is that two liters of over one hour, six days? What are we, it's very important that it's volume over time, right? Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Character and character. It's like it's green soup coming up. Uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not going down <laughs> exactly. exactly. It's going the wrong exactly. way. Exactly. Um, so you want to then mention that you've been monitoring this with outputs. You want to talk about that you are conscious of nutrition, especially somebody who gave you the history of scenario that three or four days they've not and eaten. The, the mic is swimming away from me. Yeah. Repelled by your... <laughs> What, the lack of charm. He's enthusiastic. The, the, enthusiastic. The, 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 mic, the mic is moving away because even, even the mic understands that he's talking nonsense. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the disdain for my character has gone to technology even beyond humans. Excellent. The, uh, where was I? It's, it's important that you make it clear that you are cognizant of um, the nutrition, yes. uh, frailty, uh, and fluid resuscitation. And that there, and you also got to make it clear that you're going to be flexible. You said conservative management. However, things can evolve the wrong way, and they will almost yeah. always take you down that route, or they will say continued management hasn't worked, or something along those lines, to try and make sure that you are not stuck in just, you know, what you yes. initially the strategy you initially chose. Yes. Okay. We should be clear that this is adhesional obstruction. If it was for hernias or things like that, then we'd have to. Yeah, approach. absolutely. So the scenario here is, and that's why the diagnosis early on is so important. Yes. That's why you really got to get to the diagnosis yes. quickly because it fundamentally changes what avenue you go down. Yes. So in this scenario, we have said that it's adhesional. If it was a hernia that's incarcerated, that'd be a totally different story. Yes. Okay, so you've got your adhesional bowel obstruction and you've, uh, you've treated him conservatively, um, drip and suck protocol, as they lovingly call it. That was always a horrible name. But uh, then what are you going to do now when they say to you, okay, you're still on the following ward round, and you're going to say something along the lines of serial clinical examinations, examinations and yes. overnight review and so on. So some of you worried about blood gas and so on to make sure they're not getting worse than acidosis or more tender or things aren't evolving the bad way. And they say, okay, the first day wasn't doing too badly. You had two liters through the NG tube on going. However, the second day that you came onto the ward round to review the patient, it was more tender and the NG output wasn't getting better um, and the patient looks worse as now the blood pressure is a little bit lower, a little bit tachycardic. You re-examine the patient and it's actually got localized guarding. What are you going to do now? So the situation has evolved. The clinical picture has changed to the worse. The localized guarding is worrying me that there may be early strangulation or uh, ischemic segment of bowel. Um, I'll consent the patient for a laparoscopy plus minus laparotomy uh, with a potential small marrow section or stoma formation. Perfect. We'll come back to the laparoscopy, laparotomy we'll talk and about around that. Uh, but let's just pause there. They may give you another scenario and say, okay, so the patient's actually not worsened and actually has improved a little bit. And then you talk about, okay, now would be time to give gastrographin if you can find it because there's a national shortage. There's a the national machine, shortage. National shortage of gastrographin. Um, you would give gastrographin after you did the drip and suck and then you'd speak at the NG tube for six hours. I, I would extra. talk a little bit about how to give gastrographin because I'm discovering there are a few places who have strict routines on when to, how to give it and, and when to yeah. give it. And bear in mind, if you're on a ward doesn't, where, where, where the colleagues, nursing colleagues are not necessarily surgical trained, you will take a beautiful x-ray of the bag Yes, of gastrographin in the NG bag. In the bag, yeah, 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 yeah. In the bag, it'll be there. It'll be nothing in the stomach. It'll be a nice long tube of dark kind of going through. So, so please make sure that you do tell them how, and, and ideally write in the notes as well, exactly so, how, so we'll, how we'll, are you going to do it? We'll tell this them. There's some protocols, but generally, how would you do it? So I would make sure the GI tract is completely empty, so the stomach has been fully aspirated. The, the NG tube is in the right place to begin with. Uh, it's not up in the GOJ or, or the duodenum. Um, the stomach has been fully aspirated. You or, or, or tricky, or, or tricky. <laughs> um, and 50 mils of uh, gastrographin, not urographin or anything else. It has to be gastrographin uh, or gastromyro or some of the other brands. 
um, in diluted to 100 in water and have been uh, pushed down the NG tube with a syringe and the NG tube has been spigoted and that stays in the stomach for half an hour before we reopen the NG tube. And then the protocol, um, if you looked at NASBO, which is the National Order of Small Bowel Obstruction, was to get a, a, an abdominal x-ray after six hours of doing that challenge, but you can do anything from four to eight, um, any movement in the right direction. Yeah. And then there are two markers you're looking for in terms of effect. There's a clinical marker that the patients open their bowels or pass flatus, and there's a radiological marker that you've got contrast in the colon. Excellent. That's the key steps. You want to aspirate whatever's already there so that it's not getting diluted even further in a liter of you know, energy tubes blocked or whatever and it's sitting there that doing bile, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, asp you aspirate the stomach to dryness and then you give 50 mils of gastrograph and dilute it to, with 50 mils of water to make up 100 advanced maths again um, luckily we haven't got Fahad here to struggle with the maths this particular episode and then you give that down the energy tube and then you need to spigot it that imperial PhD really paid it, for itself yeah, right? yeah, yeah. every day every day <laughs> and then you spigot it for at least two hours and then you take, take an x-ray between four and eight hours typically six hours after to see if the gastrographin is going down into the colon or you've got clinical response excellent okay Let's go back to the laparoscopy, laparotomy discussion. Let's say you gave the gastrograph and it hasn't worked and it's now day three or going on day four and you really need to do something. Or right from the start, like we said, the patient has deteriorated the wrong way. Uh, not that there's a right way to deteriorate, but it's gone the wrong way. <laughs> it's Flam gone the wrong way. Flamboyantly, yes. Has, has it, the situation has gone the wrong way and they're more tender and you're now worried about ischemia or perforation or something worse evolving and you are now consenting the patient for a laparotomy or laparoscopy. We won't go through the consent process again because I think it's been done before. Remember the five or six key ones, yes. any operations and then specific yes. to the, yes. to the um, procedure. However, let's say you would work in a multidisciplinary team manner, alerting a CPOD anesthetic consultant colleagues, the ITU team, the theatre staff, the patient as well, of course. Care, care of the elderly team. As care of the elderly team. The, the, the Absolutely. As well. The nutrition team and the, the, the colleague, nursing colleagues on the, on, the, on the ward to prepare the patient for theatre. Laparotomy or laparoscopy? Which one's the correct answer? Uh, I'm a humble upper jaw surgeon, as you know. <laughs> So it depends, you, you have to, again... The comment gets more ridiculous, I've got to say. I know, right? Um, as with the advice with all of these operative questions, you have to talk from your own experience yes. because it makes you more convincible and also shows the limit of your own experience and where you're limited. Convincing, that's all right. Convincing, sorry. I've got a cold. I'm high on the... Uh, uh, you talk from what you're used to doing within the, uh, your day one consultant, within the relevance of, of that kind of competence, within the realms of that competence. So you can, there's no harm in saying I will start with the diagnostic laparoscopy with the hopes that this is a simple, ba simple band, uh, uh, small uh, band adhesion causing obstruction. I'll make sure that the patient has been adequately decompressed before we do so. We'll do an open cut down technique in the right upper quadrant to play, say, blunt port. These are all safety, these are all increased yeah. safety. Do it how you, you like, you, you're absolutely right. And, just, the and the benefit from that as well is that the minimal uh, laparoscopy can further reduce, well, there's no evidence, there's no hard evidence, but we're the hopes that this would further less insult and, for, and hopefully reduce the recurrence of the Yeah, at the very least it's going to be less painful, right? Um, so if you can, say, if you have experience in it and say, well, in my training, I've been, I've done this before and I'm yes. trained to do a laparoscopy in this emergency scenario, However, I'd keep an open mind frame and mindset that, that I may have to, to convert, convert to open. open. Uh, so it's not wrong at all because there are instances where there's just one band that's kind of stuck around something and you, you know, it's a snip and everything is, is better again. And there's other scenarios where it's actually very densely adhesion. You can barely see anything. It's even, you can't even put your second port in. You just put a camera in and you can't see anything and you have to be prepared to convert to open. However, if you say, well, actually, I've, I've got no experience in using laparoscopy in this kind of emergency scenario, I'd go straight to laparotomy. That is not wrong either. Just be prepared. If you are going to start laparoscopy, you make it clear that you know it's not laparoscopy, or or you know, or else you you, you will switch and you're you have to keep an open mind that you can convert at any point. And they may say, "Oh, the loops of valve really dilated." You know, be very. How are you going to take care not to pop something with a 
with your javelin metal trocar. <sighs> I think you know, like you can use blunt ports. Fine. You let's say laparoscopy, laparotomy. How are you going to explore the abdomen? Um, so my method would be to identify the cecum and the terminal ileum and work my way backwards towards the DJ flexure. That is, I can access the uh, the right flank or the right iliac fossa to find the cecum. Sometimes you can't do that, and sometimes it's something obvious. But if you can't find anything obvious, that's where I would start. Fine. You, you, it, it doesn't really matter how you do it. All you need to say is having performed a comprehensive diagnostic laparoscopy, mm-hmm. looking at all four quadrants, all nine sectors, whatever you want to call it, I would start at cecum, DJ junction, whatever. If you're doing laparoscopy, of course, be very careful handling the bowel because it's going to be potentially very friable. Uh, it's going to be easy to poke your hand through or even with your hands, to be honest. Sometimes it's, it's tissue paper thin, really, isn't it? So just make sure that you're going to say that careful handling of the bowel, minimum handling, because you don't want to make the postoperative alias even more prolonged. I would start off in whatever sector you want to start off and run the, the small bowel to try and identify a potential cause. And they may say it's adhesions everywhere. And then you'd say, well, I'd start taking those ones down that are necessary. Not get carried away for four hours because you want to take down every little tiny thing that is not causing anything. Yes. You, you, as much as you love that. But, we've, you know, we've worked with don't, people who do both. Yeah, yes. But yes. You, you, you want to, you, you, remember, this is an emergency scenario. You do not want you, to be you know, here very long. You want to take them off the table quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Because the patient's likely, especially if the patient's in the physiological extremist, you do not want to be standing, standing at four hours. If you have to, you have to, but your aim should be to do the minimal amount to achieve your objective. Always the case in emergency surgery, isn't it? Yes. But equally, you do have to achieve your objective, otherwise there's no point. Okay, you've, you've, you've done that, you've done it, here's your lysis, then I may give you one of, and, and this is the point where you're going to say that ongoing, careful, and concise conversation with your team, that includes the anesthetic team, includes the theatre scrub team, and possibly even ICU calling, and where's the patient coming, etc. So you need to make, because if, the, if they give you a scenario where the anesthetic consultant or registrar says, uh, that uh, capnoperitoneum you've just put in uh, is, is really you know, giving us a lot of problems. The venous returns drop, the, the tachycardic hypotensive. If it's not tolerating laparoscopic procedure, then yeah. you have to convert to open. Absolutely. Open. So be prepared for those kind of scenarios. You perform the adhesion lysis, laparoscopy or lapotomy, whatever. It was just adhesions. It was just it was adhesions. Closing the abdomen. They may give you a scenario where you just say you close up and patient goes to ICU, great. But they may give you a scenario, really dilated loops of bowel, you've done your beautiful laparotomy, just can't bring this together. The, the edges to close the fascia, what are you gonna do? Um, there are a couple of weird things. Uh, you can try and aspirate the gas and the fluid out of the bowel to try and close it with a with a first string, but that can increase the risk of forming a fistula, a turquoise fistula. The other option is to try and leave the bowel open, or leave the abdomen open. Yeah, don't leave the bowel open. Don't leave the bowel open. It's not, not a good idea. Um, would leave the abdomen open and use a Bogota bag or a negative pressure, uh, negative pressure, yeah. a laparotomy wound control system platform uh, that they are available uh, in all the hospitals. Uh, to leave the abdomen open and come back for a relook after 48 hours once the edema and the swelling has settled. Excellent. And, and, and then they may take you down to the laparostomy and abdominal wall compartment scenario, or they may just keep them. I mean, they're going to cover all of these things, of course, because there simply isn't enough time. But we're just trying to give you a flavor of the different scenarios, how one uh, station kind of lead on to another. Shout, shout out to Alan's favorite society, the... Uh, What's it, International Open Abdomen uh, Open Abdomen Society or something like it's that? It's pretty niche, but I love it. I love the society for that. Um, and uh, yeah, so you, you may go down that scenario. Then post-operative, they say, what's your, what are you going to write in the post-operative notes? And this is where you need to come up with that MDT comprehensive plan. It's not just a case of just, oh, patient goes to ICU. Oh, by the way, pause here. We, we, we would we would, be, we would come under a very heavy fire if we didn't mention Nella. Please fill in your Nella uh, form. Put in your Nella form, yeah. yes. Yeah, absolutely. Do another form. Please do contribute. That's an important or ongoing audit. Um, and as part of that, the frailty score nutrition is kind of being increasingly emphasized in that. In your post operative instructions, you're going to have to come up with a comprehensive plan that is going to 
get you the most marks. And a lot of them is not actually what we term as purely clinical from our perspective, but actually your awareness. Remember, you're a day one consultant. You want to talk about the other things, isn't it? You want to talk about, yes, they're in ICU, and if they've got renal, you know, they've gone to AKI3 and they, the EGFR has plummeted, because EGFR was in decimal points before you gave them the contrast and has busy. gone. You, you, you need to think about things like hemofiltration, correcting the physiology, basically. So that's fluid resuscitation, input, output, antibiotic use, if that's appropriate, and whatever other supportive care in conjunction with the ICU team. But you want to talk about some of the other things that other allied healthcare professionals can provide. What are they? You, you want to talk about them mobilizing early, uh, recruiting their lungs as much as possible. You want to talk about them uh, having dietitian support, uh, make sure that they're, uh, nutri- nutri- they're nutritionally replete. So continuing TPN, you want to also uh, talk about nursing care, what they do with the NG tube. You have to be clear about these instru- the, the post-operative plan and cover all the stakeholders within that plan yep. um, so that there's no confusion if you're not around and equally that the patient gets gets home. Yep. So my personal operative strategy, and this is what I would write in notes, would be a holistic MDT approach to the patient care, which includes the intensive care team to correct or repeat the physiology, as you described, um, including fluid resuscitation, input and output, as well as other allied healthcare professionals, dietitians, physiotherapists, ICU nurse staff, to mobilize the patient early, provide adequate nutrition for the patient's needs, and to minimize the chances of complications. Do you keep them there by mouth post-op? Uh, I don't. Um, now, they, they, may, they may go down a nutrition one. Um, it depends on what uh, what kind of scenario you're facing. Yeah. The kind of, kind of extreme scenario we gave where everything's very dilated for several days, they're going to have post-op ileus, isn't it? You've got an NG tube in. Getting, if the patient's awake, having them sips of water is, is not, is not, not going to harm anyone. Yes. Even if it doesn't get absorbed, it's just going to bounce back up into the NG tube. Remember, most of the gastric content the patient's going to produce, irrespective, it's going to be water anyway. So I don't um, think that that's a problem. Big shower and chips, extra large meal from your local no, favorite place no, is probably no. not recommended. Shawarma is um, not recommended. <laughs> so, Professor, so speaking of shawarma, our opportunity to get food poisoning has increased thanks to a generous grant from Johnson & Johnson, who have uh, kindly sponsored our uh, podcast. Very episode. generous, thank you. Um, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the role in protecting your uh, beauty sleep routine and not getting up in the night to do bariatric emergencies? <laughs> yeah, they, they may feel that hasn't worked. But yes, uh, Johnson Johnson, of course, have got a very long history of supporting innovation and education and training workshops. Uh, many examples, one of which that I personally count or several of which was they sponsored my fellowship, the only bariatric uh, fellowship uh, in the UK that was sponsored uh, by industry, uh, in which I didn't have to do any on calls. So that means I could concentrate on doing the elective work uh, to obtain the numbers I needed for my uh, RCS sign-off. So very grateful. Thank you very much. And as part of a lot of other things they do, of course, is their online website. It's called webinars, online learning modules. They also, of course, sponsor a lot of webinars for other associations, namely the ASGBI um, and hands-on workshops, clinical workshops, mm-hmm. stapling, and so on. They also have the bariatric trainee pathway, uh, which I enjoyed. You go onto their um, campus in Reading and uh, you go hands-on cadaveric operating, as well as live operating at Absolutely. Luton. So it's, and again, it's, that's the only one in the UK. Uh, only one in the UK. Bariatric Plenty of effort trainees. put in there. So thank you very much, Johnson & Johnson, Absolutely. for your continuous support. Excellent. Back thank to the you. Viva. Back to the viva. <laughs> so that, that's, it's going to depend on the scenario, but I think water is absolutely fine if they're awake, of course. And then that, that would usually be where it ends, really. Now, they may talk about... There, there could be a few curveballs that they, they throw at be, you. Yeah. What are the kind of things they could throw at you? So if they find a dead loop of small bowel, yeah. are you going to join or are you going to bring out a stoma? What are you going to do? I would join. Okay. What are you, but, but before you jump into saying that, you're right, most, I think most people would, but... What do you want to say that's going to make it sound like so, you consider things? Because remember... The, the, it depends on... Uh, so I think the short answer was I'd be, I would join. The long answer would be I'd first have a discussion with the anaesthetist. Yeah. Uh, during the, during that fi- when we find that final. Excellent. So you want to say my preference would be to do a primary anastomosis, small bowel, small bowel resection, side by side, plasma and technique, staple, hands on both, neither, whatever you want to do, but just don't leave it open, as we already said. 
However, this would be dictated by the patient's current physiology. If you're given, if you're given a very extreme damage limitation, patient's about to crash on the table and three you just staple other, things off. Three different isotropes. Yeah, exactly. Staple everything off, leave everything in discontinuity and come back later. Yes. That's a different scenario. And then yes. be prepared to do that. But what you want to say is this would be my decision. My preference would be to join. And that's how I've been trained. Resect bus uh, and the technique we just described or however we usually do it. Hand sewn, staple, whatever, it's up to you. It doesn't matter. Just say what you would usually do. However, does this my decision would be ultimately dictated by the current the patient's current physiology. The and this is where I have a discussion with discussion with the anesthetist. Exactly that. Exactly. Uh, uh, but if they get and just to, if you decide to anastomose because the risk of uh, complications from a high output proximal stoma. Uh, are worse, are, are really terrible. Yeah. Uh, they can drive your renal failure even worse, drive your mortality even higher. So uh, again, but if there's compromised bowel, an anastomosis is a clearly bad idea. Yeah. Nothing wrong with stippling off, coming back a couple of yeah. days later. And, and, and remember, you're, you're talking to people who have been consultant surgeon, he or They've she. They've been in the game many, for many years. Yeah, they, been, they, they know what it's like, they know there isn't one. You know, this isn't about... It, it could go down any one of these lines. It's just about having the ability, no matter which road we go down, you demonstrate. That's the really key point. This is the higher level thinking that they keep talking about to get the most marks. It's demonstrating that you have considered all the options and you are aware there's different places you can go down and you're not just a one-trick pony as it were that you'll just stick to oh yeah i always join that's what you don't want to come because then they'll say oh really what if there is you know dead bowel everywhere there's fecal contamination everywhere and the bowel is really friable and the patient is on quadruple strength iron tropes or whatever then obviously you're going to have to say something uh, that, that that will fit that would demonstrate you've responded to that scenario rather than get stuck. No, no, I still join. So it's important that you've got that flexibility. What are the other curveballs? You've done a beautiful operation and then day seven. What, in your hands? Yeah, I know, right? A broken clock is twi right twice a day. <laughs> um, you've done a beautiful operation, you know, your SHO adores you. But not if it ticks really slowly because then it'll never be Yeah, absolutely. This is what we've got here. And day seven, now there's now bile coming out of the midline. What, what? It's probably because you left the bowel open. Yeah. <laughs> Don't need to close it. <laughs> Don't look, I need to yeah. breathe. So you're right. You need to be um, careful that the scenario may not end there. You may get, get to this point really, really quickly. And, and they actually want to talk about... And they're the, setting up something else. And they're set, yeah, they're setting up some, uh, you know, some kind of big disaster that later down, down the line. And you have to be... And this is where reassessment talking and speaking, working with your ICU colleagues in that multidisciplinary team fashion is important. Okay, you did a great operation. You, you may zoom through all of what we've just said in two minutes, or they, you know, they may want yeah. to get there because they really want to talk about actually day three or day five or whatever, still an ICU, yeah. and there's now some, you know, you're facing essentially a possible fistula or... Or they're going to take you to abdominal compartment syndrome or anything. Exactly. They want to take you anywhere, really. In that scenario, you just give us this bile, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bile coming through the midline. What are you going to do? You have reassess the patient. I've the alley. patient. I'm, th you? I'm thinking this in enterocutaneous fistula. I will treat that according to the SNAP protocol. Make sure he's on... Uh, so SNAP is sepsis, nutrition, uh, delineating the anatomy and procedure if required. Um, but what's... Before you... We, we think it's a fistula. We think it is. How do we know that? I mean, not, not in your hands, surely, but how do we know this beautiful anastomosis that you did is somebody that was on so, 16 kilos of adrenaline? Uh, I don't know if adrenaline comes in kilos, it probably doesn't. But it, what, what, how do we know this is an actually now bowel death after your joint, or not necessarily from your joint, but from somewhere else, somewhere right? Somewhere else. So it could be, there could be liters of bile inside the abdomen. So how... What are we going to say? You need to be... So first, assess the patient diagnosis. and say it's safe. We don't need to do a... We need to establish this diagnosis, but also ensure that we don't need to take the patient back to the right that? now. So but a CT with oral contrast. Exactly. You're going to get a CT with double contrast, double ideally. Contrast. You're going to get... That, that's what's critical. You've got to reassess. You've got to go back and not just say, oh, yeah, this is a fistula. We'll, we'll just treat it conservatively. No, you need to get the anatomy right. That's what you don't want to do because they're going to think, oh, really? You know, could it be something else? And this is what I mean about the flexibility. You've got to be prepared that this could be one of half a dozen scenarios. 
Uh, it may be a tiny little fistula that will close by itself. It may be two liters of bile in the abdomen, right? You, need, you can't make any assumption. The, the key strategy here would be to establish exactly what this bile leak is or what this uh, discharge is. And to do that, I would obtain an immediate CT with IV and oral contrast. If it's just coming out of the abdomen, you've got a controlled intracutaneous fistula. Okay, fine. If, however, there's bile everywhere, you're going to go back. Now, if it's a laparostomy, then you're going to see it. But um, this is the important that you don't box yourself into this hole um, and make assumptions about what you think the scenario is going to be. Yes, uh, clearly. So make sure he's on antibiotics. TPN is continuing as, as promised. It's on the quantity that's coming out, uh, you want to... Over time. Over time. Over time. Absolutely. The quantity and the character. Uh, you want to uh, establish whether it's proximal or distal to your anastomosis. Not really makes much of, much of a difference, but you want to uh, early management for a fistula is conservative management. Uh, keep them in by mouth for three days. Um, not more than that, because most of the time they close off by themselves. Uh, if it's persistently patent and there's lots of bile coming out every day, you might want to think about uh, octreotide or something similar. Uh, Octreotide is a serotonin. No, not serotonin. Somatostatin. Somatost yeah. yeah, somatostatin. Oh, mate, I'm not even a fucking surgeon. You're the nerd here. <laughs> <laughs> is a somatostatin give agonist. Serotonin, give, give me serotonin for the depression. And, 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 give me serotonin. And give have, me somatostatin. And, and some for yourself, because, yeah. <laughs> You'll feel really bad. you feel really shit about it. But. Um, so you, they're going to be on a PPI, aren't they? Because they're PPI. Sure. Somatostatin agonist. You somatostatin analogues. analogues. There's some evidence, but. Yeah, I wouldn't get too hung up about it. Makes that. you feel better. Um, what the serotonin was about stuff. Is. <laughs> you also li liaise with your intestinal failure unit, yes, uh, which is regional. And that's that's an excellent follow point because that's the other scenario they could take you down to. Is like, okay, the patient's now kind of out of trouble. Has been on a ward from stepped down to the ward, but been there for like a three, four, five weeks, and actually, or, or you resected a whole bunch of bowel, and it actually hasn't got much bowel left. You're going to be prepared for the discussion to go down to intestinal failure, which we're not going to tackle today because that's a really that's topic, a broad topic, a topic all by itself, which we will cover at some point eventually. <laughs> I can ask you about any current audits or any current guidelines. Yeah. So we mentioned NASBO, National Audit of Small Bowel Obstruction, happened in 2016. No, of course, has been around Na for a National long time National now. National Laparotomy Audit, twelfth 12th, 12th year, 12th year running. Uh, there is a non-operative laparotomy management audit as part of NELA, which is NOLAP. Uh, there is uh, ELF, which also looks at non-operative management, uh, which has actually was the precursor to know that. Yep. Uh, and lastly, there's ASGBI, small bowel protocol. There's the Bologna criteria, which part of the world's World Society of Emergency Surgery. Uh, so these are all kind of guidelines that you need to be aware of. And the other one, of course, is colleagues in the British Hernia Society doing the... The National, National uh, Open, Open Abdomen Audit. NOAA. And these are the kind of things you want to name drop in the appropriate place, not just reel them off. But um, you could say something like, I would, there are several guidelines and protocols that I use, and which of one you use in your clinical practice that I use, including the SGBI protocol, which there, once again is an excellent one pager on, on their website. That's really useful, uh, as well as the NELA um, and the uh, NASBO. Um, Audit. Protocols or yeah. audit. And that usually should be the end of the That should be it. Uh, they may mention um, the ad, uh, adjuvant treatments to preventing uh, bowel yeah. adhesion. And, and really, if you're going, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but if you're really getting into that, then you're, you're, you've kind of exhausted everything. You're and you're going doing to well. level nine there yeah. for. Yeah, if you, and then once again, if you are still having, if the questions are still relatively, or you think they're relatively straightforward and easy, by, you know, three quarters of the way in, you're probably not doing great. If they're really hard, even halfway through, you're, you're actually doing quite well because you know, it means you've ticked a lot of their boxes on the clipboard. You know, if you're still struggling with the NG tube, <laughs> five minutes in, you've got, trouble, you've got problems. But if they're starting to talk about, okay, how do you know of any techniques that you could potentially to reduce adhesions or minimize so that we think may be helpful? That discussion is a good one to have, apart from saying things like, Laparoscopy versus open generates less adhesions. Sometimes antibiotics. Yeah. No starch under gloves. Yeah, exactly. Those kind of things. Careful handling of the bowel. Oh, good really. surgical technique intersection. Smashing your way through with a mallet, um, which, which should be a given. But <laughs> <laughs> um, lutein trauma laparotomy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
the, 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 the objective should be to create, to create less trauma, less than, trauma. The, <laughs> less than the actual car crash did. And, but, uh, and, no, and no psychological trauma. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're all involved. <laughs> but um, the other thing is there are certain devices now that have been used, some evidence, varying degrees of evidence behind them that have kind of been around for a few years now, actually. Mm -hmm. And I don't have extensive experience with this, you know, a few times in my training, but you can mention them, such as these kind of devices and meshes that you can put in. Mm. Uh, not really a mesh, but it's kind of cellophane type um, so, yeah. things, yeah. kind of material that's meant to reduce ad uh, adhesions and even electively some... Better described and summarized in the Bologna paper. Yes.